why do physicists now begin to talk about universes? Are they saying that the folks who cannot know about the folks over there are in a categorically different place because there is no information from there going to there? Are they, are, are they I'm in talking a about a whole other zone where it is likely that the laws of physics themselves are different, however slightly, from the laws of physics in this universe. The multiverse prescribes the fact that you would have variations in the laws of physics among the universes. That's the example with the coin. We are speaking from a universe where the laws of physics allow life. But let me ask you this more So precisely. are we special or are we just the person who flipped heads 10 times? When you use the word universe in the plural, when you say universe says, are you thinking of distinctly yes. isolated yes. neighborhoods yes. in a common place? No, no, uh -huh. no. <laughs> I'm so, thinking of distinct, uh, we all share the same laws of physics, e even the ones outside your horizon. Okay. So we, we are family. We are family. So the, the, the gravity exists for all of us, entropy yes. exists for all of yes. us, strong forces, weak forces, electromagnetism for all of us. Yes. There's an elementary table that exists for all of us in this. Table of elements. Ta yes. Table of elements. But, the, but so then, and then around us, beyond the us, there is a place where you might go and have all the rules different. Yes. Even the rules of physics, even the no, rules No, that of is what would be different. Everything issues forth from the laws of physics. Hmm. Now, now the, what that well, means why is- Why do you need well, this? Wait, what that means is, you don't want to be the first explorer in this other universe, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because, because, you know, you're kind of held together by these laws of physics. Yeah. And if the charge on the electron were just slightly different, you could explode or implode or you just, you, you don't, you want to send the probe, the test probe first. Mm -hmm. Then you come later. Just, just so you know, in case it ever comes up. Why would any intelligent person need to conjure up a place, a big expansive place, where the rules, the basic rules are different? Why does anyone talk about that? In my ordinary life, going, you know, having breakfast, going to work, coming back home, it just never comes up. No one ever asks me about other universes and other, other rules of engagement. I'm kind of content to know that, as barely I can make them out, the rules that Einstein and, and, and his crowd sort of fit, well, they fit and I'm okay with that. Why is there this need for a non-fitting set of places? I don't think of it as a need. I think of it as... the urge to understand your place in the universe. And that urge crosses cultures and has existed throughout time. It's just that the scale is different. Why is this question different from sitting there in the cave, chewing on uncooked meat, looking across the valley and saying, I wonder what's on the other side of that valley. I want to try to find out. But your counterpart back then would say, why do you need to know that? You got your, you know, pterodactyl leg or whatever you're chewing on. <laughs> and it wouldn't have been pterodactyl. You got your saber-toothed tiger leg and you just lost your friend, you know, in the tar pit. And you're saying, I got my food. I got my crib. What do I need to look on the other side of the valley? But then you find out the other side of the valley, there's water and fruit and fire and stuff that you can use. You don't know how to use it yet, you figure out how to use it, okay? So, the frontier of human exploration has always delivered dividends on who and what we are in the lives we lead. And some deliver more dividends than others. Now you might think, another universe with different laws of physics, how could that possibly relate? And right now, I don't know how that could relate. I'm not going to pretend to have a whole list of how I'm going to invoke it tomorrow. But I look at the history of science, the history of discovery, and I will not deny our species the privilege, if not the obligation, to look beyond whatever is your perceived horizon of the moment. And by the way, we live in a wealthy nation, and wealthy nations, it's kind of that duty falls on them because they don't have to worry about where the next meal is coming from. They have enough money to sort of pay everything out and save a little bit for that exploration. I'm proud and privileged to be part of a species 
that has people that want to do that. I joke with people who climb mountains and put their lives at risk, but that, that soul of exploration is what creates the urge to want to know what these other universes are like. Well, let me go from a question of wealth, which is asking too many questions, to the utter poverty of one of the chapters of your book. In 22, you say, you know what? We don't know what the... S when we look up in the night sky and we see stuff, we look down at our shoes and at wood and at glass, and we see stuff, and we look at the stars, and we see that stuff and the galaxies and that stuff, that stuff turns out to be a little of what's in the universe, but not most, not much. It's 4% of Four. the total universe. Everything you know and love is 4% of the total universe. When did... All matter and all energy that you know and love, all the photons of light, all the particles of matter, when you add it all up, it's 4% of the total energy budget of the universe. That's sad. Uh, are you sad that it's that little, or are you sad that we have no clue what the other 96% is? <laughs> Which of those two facts makes you sad? Well, I, the book consistently makes the case for how dumb, uninformed, and, um, and, and in the dark we are, and this pretty well clinches the argument. If that much of everything is missing and comes with no explanation, and yet is plainly, apparently, doing things, I mean, the reason that galaxies seems to hold their shape is because there's this invisible stuff that makes them do so. Dark matter, for yeah. lack of a better word. We don't know what it is. It's a source of gravity whose origin we have no clue. Dark matter. So we call it dark matter. We don't even know if it's matter. But it's a source of gravity that exhibits itself in the cosmos. There's six times as much of that as there is ordinary matter. So that's, that was our first encounter with total stupid ignorance. Then, 10 years ago, or 1998, it was published in 1998, we discovered 70% of the rest of the universe is this mysterious pressure operating opposite that of gravity that's making the expansion of the universe accelerate. We don't know what that is either. We call it dark energy. So you have dark matter and dark energy combined make up 97% of what's going on in the universe. We have no clue what either of those is composed of. So, on another term... <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, 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 wait. No, we're not as stupid as that might sound. We're not inventing... So we're not inventing sort of angels on the head of a pin. This is not the case of the ether in the 19th century, where we knew, light, we knew waves had to go through a medium. Sound moves through air and through solid objects. Light is a wave. Space must have some medium out there. Let's call it the ether. The ether was an invention. There was no evidence for the ether. It was an assumption. And then it went away when we found out light doesn't need a medium in which to vibrate. It can travel through empty space just fine. We remember we called that nothing. Okay. Now, turns out, dark matter and dark energy, we measure it. It's there. We're not inventing a concept. These are just words. They're placeholder words. There is this entity that has gravity, and we don't know what's causing it. But we know where it is, we know how much gravity it exhibits. The acceleration of the universe, we can measure its effect on the expanding fabric of the cosmos. We don't know what's doing it. So we're better off than the ether people. <laughs> I'm going to switch gears because the first half of the book does de definitely impress you with how little we know, even though it starts with all these guys in the 1880s saying, we know everything, it's all over, the end of science, we're all over, fine. And then you read and you read and you think, we know less, we know less, we know less. And then we get to the subject of life, and then you turn sort of buoyant in this book. Uh, I'm not sure why, but let's go do it. Uh, the, the question here is, why life is there is life? Buoyant. Life is a and buoyant. And then, are we alone? Are there, are there, so let's just do this in order. Why, are, why do you think there are living things? There is absolutely no necessity for dust to aggregate and become vital, not less, let alone think. Uh, do we know why we have life? I guess not. But why? Allow me to address that. Yes. If you look at the chemical ingredients of life itself, uh, you remember from biology class, we're mostly water. And good old water is H2O. 
two hydrogens, one oxygen. And if you could look at the sort of the element budget of life, hydrogen is number one, as expressed in the water molecule. The number two in the human body is oxygen, turns out. Number three in the human body is carbon. Four is nitrogen. Five, you find on all lists, is other. Okay, <laughs> now if you go to the universe, <laughs> That's the O on the periodic table. You didn't know that? <laughs> <laughs> That's not for oxygen, it's for other. Um, so, you go into the universe, number one ingredient in the universe is hydrogen. That was true in life. Number two ingredient in the universe is helium. We don't have that yeah, one. Yeah, it doesn't, nope. doesn't like anybody. No, how come? Well, because helium is chemically inert. You can't do anything with it even if you wanted. You can inhale it, okay? <laughs> and sound like Mickey Mouse, yes. Next in the universe is oxygen. Next, carbon. Next, other. Thank you, in the third <laughs> row there. So, actually that was the second row. They must be related to the second row here. We are one for one matchup with the most abundant ingredients in the universe. Of these, carbon is the most chemically fertile element in the entire periodic table. You can make more kinds of molecules with carbon than all other molecules combined. So, if you were going to experiment through the forces of nature with complex chemistry, and you had to pick an element to base it on, carbon is your man, or your woman, however that goes. Okay, so, what I'm saying is, Given, the, given the, what carbon is capable of doing, perhaps we shouldn't be so surprised that there's life because we are carbon-based life. We're just another one of the things carbon has rolled up its sleeve. Maybe life is inevitable given the abundance of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and hydrogen in the universe. I'm gonna try, try to invert that view. Otherwise, you're left thinking, hey, we're special. You know how, you know I would give you right to say you're special? If life on Earth were made of an isotope of bismuth. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff is nowhere in the, in the cosmos. And then we're made of it, we're special. Okay, but if we're the most common ingredients of the ingredients of the, of the matter that we know and love, you don't have an argument well, that, me, that somehow me, life let, let, is exotic. Let, let me just make sure I understand what you're saying. I don't know that everybody in this room or everyone in the world would think that life is merely an aggregate of the right chemicals in the right order, all holding hands in the right way. You get your carbon, you get your oxygen, you get your nitrogen, you get your hydrogen, and you put it all in the right way, and bing, up comes a little cell, and then you get a bigger thing, and then you get a fish, and then you get a you. Um, it may be. Is that your view? That the world is pregnant with life because all life is is a chemical machine arranged in some lucky way. They don't even like the word lucky. In some... Yeah, was the guy lucky? Only yeah, or... never mind. Okay. Okay. I thought uh, we got through that. Yeah, okay, okay. we did. We did. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? That, that, that's your view? That, that you I'd rather need... say it a different way. Okay. I'd rather say that given the chemical fertility of carbon and the abundance of all the ingredients in the universe that is fundamental to life as we know it, I'm not given any reason to doubt that the formation of life from out of chemical soups brewing either in our solar system or across the galaxy or the cosmos itself, I'm not given reason to believe that that should be a rare phenomenon.